the one and only Jessica Orrick. Wow. So yeah. Um, anyway, there's water here. I'll, I can get you Thank some in a second. Um, anyway, so let me just tell you real quick a little bit about Jessica. Um, Jessica Orrick makes projects large and small that hope to re-inspire a sense of wonder about the world of the everyday. Her features, The Vanquishing, Vanquishing of the Witch, Baba Yaga, Beetle Queen Conquers Tokyo, and Atsinki, the story of Arctic Cowboys, um, focus on ethnobiology and unique geospecific cultures. Um, her recent web series, there's no um in there, I just put that in. <laughs> um, her, her recent web series for TED, uh, Mysteries of the Vernacular, breathes fresh life um, to an alphabet of common words while her new kid series, Arthropoda, Othropoda? Arthropoda. Um, stars some of the world's most fascinating creepy crawlies. So um, her work's amazing and I've, I feel very lucky to have seen it. So yeah, welcome. Thank you. Thanks very much for coming out tonight. Cool. So my first question would be, what scared you as a child? Oh, everything. I am such a scary cat. <laughs> I'm still afraid of everything. Heights, um, wide open spaces, scary movies, the dark, um, dying in any fashion other than falling asleep. Falling asleep. I, I mean, I'm afraid of everything. I'm, <laughs> I'm just, I'm terrified all the time. Was there a fairy tale that like stuck out in your oh, mind? Oh, you mean story-wise? Yeah, just, you know. Um, no, I mean, I was really scared of everything. Like Snow White, God, that movie scared me so much. <laughs> Whew. Yeah, that was terrifying. That was a big influence, actually, that forest scene when Snow White gets lost in the forest when she's running away. Yeah, that was the way the branches would come. Ooh, yeah. Uh, so that was really, when I talked to the animator about doing that, I was like, yeah, the branches, you know, like Snow White. He had no idea what I was talking about. He was not moved by that scene. <laughs> um. So uh, the reason I asked that was because I was wondering if there's some impetus for the Baba Yaga story, the film. Like, was there something? I mean, you, you always have to have a, a moment when you're like, yeah, I got to do that film. Um, so I was wondering if it related to fairy tales when you were a child, or what's, what's the deal? Um, no, it actually related to mycology. Um, I had just finished Beetle Queen, which is my first film, which was about the Japanese love of insects, bugs. Um, and I was looking for a similar cultural phenomenon that seemed equally foreign to Americans. Um, and one of the things I had been reading about was how much Eastern Europeans love mushroom collecting. Um, and I've always grown up in cities, and we would stomp on mushrooms. They were definitely not something. I mean, we ate them on pizza, but that, did, that was, felt like a very different type of mushroom. Um, so I was. I was like, oh, another, another culture that loves something that we as Americans think are sort of gross and dirty. This seems like it's right up my alley. Um, so I started doing research about mushroom collecting in Eastern Europe. And the more I researched about it, the more I became fascinated by um, the mythology, the way that Baba Yaga was always um, portrayed with mushrooms around her hut, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then. The first time I went to Eastern Europe, I, Andre Kudrescu, um had introduced me to a group of poets in Romania. And so the first two weeks that I was there, I just lived with these poets. And we would go hiking in the woods, and I would talk to them about the woods and social dissidents and mushroom collecting and all sorts of things. Um, and they said some pretty wild stuff, but the things that interested me the most were the way they talked about using the woods as a way to escape, you know, Ceausescu's reign and the sort of things that they had been subjected to. And that really shifted my focus in the film and it became much more about sort of the, the ideas of wilderness and yeah. how the fairy tales shape them. That was a very long answer for a question that didn't really ask that question. No, keep, keep, keep it up, keep it up. Um, so, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, escaping war, you know, escaping into the forest. Um, you know, Ukraine was invaded after you made this film. Yeah. Which was, you know, I didn't realize that when I first watched this film. And then I, I saw the end with the, the animation, you know, using the comb to escape into the woods. Did that, I mean, 
how does that, it seems like kind of a big coincidence in a weird way. Was that planned? Or you what's... know, I mean, it would, we, I had finished, the, yeah, I planned the invasion uh, of Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> Why? No, no I, um, I had already finished the film when that happened, but it was weird because wow. we had shot in Kiev and we had been in the square um, where, you know, all of that terrible stuff had happened. And we, when we were there, there was a pop star who had set up a stage and, it felt so first, I mean, it was just, everybody was just dancing and singing and it was crazy costumes and it was so, I don't know, it was about as far away from the scene of a crime as you could get. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was definitely startling to watch that footage. And yeah, yeah, that's one of my favorite thing about documentary is the fact that you preserve a place and time, you know, for mm -hmm. better or worse, and you know, to educate, to um, inspire, to enlighten, you know, and I think that's that's one of my favorite aspects of uh, the documentary uh, world. So yeah. uh, that's that's beautiful what you've done. <laughs> um, all right, so more <laughs> questions. You ready? Yeah, okay. I hope so. All right, so um, one of my favorite things about this film. Um, it's basically your structure. You can't look. Okay. All right. I won't. Um, oh, but the structure, uh, basically, you know, you wrap, um, you know, documentary. Basically, you got the spine of the, the the tale of Baba Yaga, you know, the animated spine, you know, wrapped around the, the live action of everything. Um, the kind of um, direct cinema, you know, vignettes of, of life, and I love how they reflect on um, the actual tale itself and bring further credence and belief. Um, tell me about your structure and, and why you're like, it's, it, it must be this way. <laughs> um, it's super unhip to say, but my process is really intuitive and um, I'm not very good at talking about it. I, I mean, part of the thing with this film for me was, well, I mean, so much of it was research. Um, and but it was a very organic process. I was writing the fairy tale at the same time that I was writing the narration, at the same time that I was editing. Um, and so it was just trying to build things that would fit together. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that was a big part of it was that I was working very specifically um, in between sleep and waking and in between being drunk and sober. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, part of, uh, for me, a lot of the film is about liminal states and sort of being in between um, and being and sort of. It, it feels feels transcendental. It's like a, it's a purely transcendental um, film experience. Oh, and thank you. I mean, yeah. I, well, I love that. <laughs> I was. I mean, they they ta I, a lot of the research was about sort of the those borders, you know, as the narration says, those borders and those those states where you're you're on the threshold between two things and so that was that was a lot of the way I was working I would I would work in bed mm -hmm. and set things up so that as I was falling asleep I would wake myself up mm -hmm. and then I would work for a little bit and then fall asleep a little bit which is a really uncool thing to admit but that was that was um, a big part of it for me because I felt like it was an easy way for me to turn off my self-negating perfectionist yeah. and um, and yeah, sort beautiful. of let the film talk for itself Cool. All right. So, um, you know, you say you're intuitive, but obviously you, you work on things and work on things and work on things, <laughs> especially in post. I mean, yeah. with documentary. Yeah. Um, so I know your filmmaking kind of goes contrary to the, the mainstream in, in, in many respects, um, especially in terms of pacing and, and, you know, structure and that sort of thing. But were you pressured or are you pressured by anybody like, we got we to gotta speed that up. Come on, chop, chop. No, I mean, luckily, um, I was I was really lucky with this film. This film took five years to make, which is really scary to say. But um, and there was a group of funders behind it, and they were really amazing. And I, in between, I stopped making this film and made a different film, and they still were really supportive and on board. And I was very lucky with that. Cool. So I mean, okay. So how about internal pressure? Like oh like, God, yeah. I mean, that's part of the reason that the, yeah. you, I have to work in liminal states is because there's, I have this yapping, really annoying voice that's always telling me I'm not good enough. Yeah. 
Nice. All right. Question, <laughs> doesn't everybody yourself. have that? Doesn't yeah, yeah. everybody have that? Yeah. I hope. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I hope I'm not alone in that. <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. Um, um, all right. Man, you're, you're rocketing through these questions. I'm sorry. Well, you're going to have to speak slower. Okay. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. Um, all right, so one of my favorite things about your filmmaking, um, you know, I, I saw this film first and I actually worked backwards um, with everything you've done. Um, but anyway, um, I love the way you use music. I love your sound design. Um, it's just, it's, there's no better way to put it, I think, than it's badass. Thanks. So I am, I am in awe of what you're doing <laughs> in that regard. Um, so how do you go about choosing your music, designing your sound? Is it, is it part of your pre-production process? It's a, it's a long process. Um, so this film and my first film I made with um, a cinematographer named Sean Price Williams, who I was also living with at the time. Um, and yeah, Sean Price <laughs> yeah, Sean. Yeah. Um, and Sean uh, is a really amazing mind. He has a mind like a, a, in, nobody else I've ever met. Um, and it's, he, I mean, the closest thing to a photographic memory that I've ever seen without memory training. Um, and he, when I decided I wanted to make a film in Japan, he was like, well, here are 3,000 of the best Japanese pop songs from between 1962 and 1991, you know, and this is, I've organized them for you. <laughs> and um, so we actually loved Japanese pop before that, um, which is one of the reasons we had met the first time. But um, so the Japanese pop music that came from Beetle Queen was very much influenced by my love of Japanese pop music. But this film, Sean did the same thing. Before we went to Eastern Europe together, he gave me you know, several thousand songs, all very neatly labeled you know, and annotated. and. Um, and I just listened to them and I put together a sort of a mixtape that we would listen to while we were shooting mm. and then um, gave the, the same mixtape to the composer. And I was like, this is the way I want it to sound. This is, uh. the, this is the scene that you're going to be composing to and um, go for it, try, give it a try. And I worked with this composer, Paul Grimstad, who is an incredible, talented guy. Um, and we worked out a really great system where he would build me a track that he thought was right. And I'd say, well, I don't, you know, there are certain things I don't like about it. And we'd go back and forth. And finally, he was like, you know what? I'm just going to give you all of the pieces of this music separately. And you can do whatever you need to do with it. And so he would give me these Legos. And I could sort of build the song the way I wanted to based on the sounds and get it to fit just right with the music. Um, and the other thing is that I record my own sound. Sean would sh shoot and I would record sound. Um, and I'm, I've never really been interested in sync sound. And so I would always, you know, he'd be shooting and I trust Sean implicitly, so I would just let him do his thing and then I would wander off and record sound. And I was almost never interested in what was actually happening in front of his camera. Um, and so, I mean, of course I was, but not in, not in terms of the actual soundscape that was happening in front of his camera. Um, so, you know, working with those two mediums totally separately, that was, I think there's only, you know, three moments of sync sound in the entire movie. Um, but that, to me, it's like its own, it's its own thing. It has nothing to do with the visuals. Yeah, um, yeah, there's a, there's a certain sense of like, I love how like electronic-y it is. It's like avant-garde electronic mixed with this kind of Brothers Grimm fairy tale, you know, in particular in, in the Baba. Mm -hmm. um, I just I really, really just kind of took me to another place. So, I mean, I guess I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? You want some water? <laughs> no, no I'm good. I'm good. All right. So I'm trying not to pour water over the questions and okay. the answers. Um, okay. All right. So obviously you've been all over. <laughs> all right. Obviously, you've been all over, um, and you know the, the most important thing with Doc is is to you know really respect that community and be part of a community and have them accept you. Um, so, it, uh, it sounds like you kind of started to answer. You had the group of poets um, in the Ukraine who were in Romania. In Romania. Yeah. 
I think um, one of the things that I love about documentary filmmaking um, is that you get to wander into these worlds and see places that you would never get to see as a tourist. Um, I, that sort of has become my reason to make documentaries. It sort of trumps the filmmaking itself in a way, is just to put myself in a, in a situation where I get to know people that would never normally open up to somebody like me. Um, and being in a foreign country, it's sort of doubled on itself because I don't speak any other language besides English, which I speak poorly as it is. But um, so there's a certain level of safety that I think subjects feel in the fact that I don't speak their language um, because they, they, even though we're in their space and we're in their face with cameras, they still have a sense of privacy because we can't understand what they're saying. Um, and I love that. I love being surrounded by people that I have no idea what they're saying. I find it really comforting. Um, I lived for a year in the Arctic with a family of reindeer herders for the film I made while I was making this one. And I just, none of them spoke English. And I would just sit around with these people and they would all just speak Finnish and I would just sit there. And it was, I don't know, it was so comforting and wonderful to me to just be not alone, but also be isolated. I don't, I, I yeah, find that yeah, a really yeah. fascinating thing. Um, but yeah, I, I like to, I, I think maybe because I'm afraid of everything, it means I have to not be afraid of anything. And so I have to, I just have to do things that I'm afraid of all the time. And so I really like to put myself in situations where I can't possibly know the outcome. Um, one of my favorite times was we were staying in, um, we were in, in the Carpathian Mountains in Ukraine. I have no idea where we were. We had just stumbled on this hotel late at night. It wasn't really a hotel, it was a bar with a room. And there were like four of us in the room, you know, these two Polish kids and um, a, a Ukrainian kid, a Polish kid, and they were kids. I mean, we, would, we couldn't afford real translators or producers or anything, so we would hire high school students that were learning English and they would be our translators. <laughs> and so we had these two high school students, a Polish guy and a Ukrainian guy, and it was Sean and I. And um, <clears throat> we were at the bar in the morning where they served breakfast. Um, and this tiny little Ukrainian high school student, these, these four guys walk into the bar, and they each order double shots of vodka and double shots of espresso. And they just... It's probably five in the morning. I don't know. I mean, it was early. We were up early. And they just take the shots of vodka, take the shots of espresso. And I told the high school kid, I was like, we're going with them. Go talk to them. And he was like, oh, I, I don't think I can. And um, yeah, we, I was like, nope, do it. It's your job. So he went up and asked them if we could follow them. And they laughed at us. And we're like, yeah, I guess so. And um, so they led us deep. We had no idea what they were doing. They led us deep into the woods through these mud swamps. What, the poor Polish kid lost his shoe in one of the muddy swamps. And he was, so the whole day, he was just hopping around. Um, but yeah, I took really great care of my crew. Oh my gosh, I was such a bad, so bad. Um, but we get way out into the woods. And there's this little lean-to that they have on the river. And they pull these chainsaws out of the lean-to and they chop down those two trees and those horses appear out of nowhere and they pull those trees away and then they chop down those two trees and then they were like oh it's lunchtime join us and so we sit down in their little lean-to and they pull spoons out of the roof and they pull vodka out of this little hole in the ground <laughs> and then out of nowhere they pull this lunch that was I mean it was so decadent. The people there, were, I've never met people so generous. I mean, it was, and everything was homemade. Homemade bread, freshly churned butter, um, just, you know, stuffed cabbages. And they lay out this whole feast and pass around the vodka. And we just spent the afternoon eating and drinking with them. We didn't speak any languages. And the poor, the poor, the poor high school student was way too terrified to translate. He just sat there sort of shaking the whole time. Um, but we got along anyway, and it was really, I don't know, it was a really magical experience. And I love that footage that we got of them chopping down those trees. So Chainsaws and vodka. Chainsaws and vodka, awesome. a great combo. That's my new band. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so, you know, you talking about 
the the trees being chopped down and stuff um, you know obviously there's a ton of subtext and metaphor woven throughout all your work um, and it, it definitely made me personally look at the world in a different way even though I was like talking to a friend last night looking out the window and then things were different and I was mm. looking at like this tree blowing in my, my uh, this monitor I have next to it and you know seeing the man and nature collide um, what do you want people to take away from from your your this film in particular I mean what's what's your should it be said or should it just be yeah interpreted that feels like the magicians like I <laughs> want everybody to see the rabbit and this is here how it's done yeah. um, I mean part of part of the, the way I make films is I don't want to call them purposefully obtuse but maybe purposefully ambiguous um, they're very thick to use an anthropologist term. I mean, to me, there are so many different layers of meaning in every single shot and in every single word that I chose, and the reason that I chose the sound. Um, I have ideas about, I mean, obviously, there are very specific reasons why things are in there, but I have ideas of what I want people to take away, but I also love more to hear what people take away themselves. So. I definitely don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, but I hope that I hope that at least there's. Um, I, I can tell you. I mean, I just <laughs> I'll tell you I, exactly what I think. Um, I, I felt like it was it was beautiful storytelling as as stated. Um, I, I felt like you were kind of showing how you know the mystery and the magic of the world is kind of being destroyed by man in many respects. That's so obvious. I don't know. I, you know, you know, the older you get, the more you know. And it's just like, you know, Disney films are just like, oh God, they warped my childhood. <laughs> Those bastards. You know. Um, yeah. But um, I don't know. Maybe somebody will ask a great question coming up here about yeah. that. Who knows? Yeah. No. I mean, and I certainly there's lots of there's there's lots of that in there. Um, I like to think it's a little bit more hopeful than that. But um, yeah, but there's there's lots of that. I mean, yeah. I'm I really want to be optimistic about the future, but of course, it's hard to most of the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, that's that's good. Um, I try to be positive too, but you know, sometimes. <laughs> All right. So um, you know, you basically you you like you, you basically you've got film. Film's a very expensive medium, and you're shooting Baba Yaga on on film, and yeah. so then you're like, all right, I got you know, two thousand, three thousand dollars worth of um, you know, film in my camera here, in between all the processing and all that. Let's go out and follow these guys who just drank vodka, you know, <laughs> um, like how. Do you, do you get scared in terms of the economics of the filmmaking? We, I got scared, not in terms of the economics of how much the film cost, because we actually got a great deal with Kodak. Um, and we had most of it processed in Ukraine, so it was okay. very inexpensive. Um, a real trouble to get across the border, but it was, um, yeah, but it was great. Um, meeting the guy, this Ukrainian guy with this giant mustache. Late at night, we dropped off the film at like four at night, four in the morning. He was just there, you know, running, running the chemicals. We're like, okay. <laughs> I, I mean, they had no computers or anything. He just wrote our, our address down on a little slip of paper. We're like, we're never going to see this film again. That's it. It's never coming back. But we found it. Um, yeah, but in terms of, we had to be very careful about how much film we could shoot at any one time because we had a certain number of rolls and there was no way we were getting more. So, so. I, I, was, I was wondering, did you yeah. purposely pick the film aesthetic because you could work with limitations? And I, I, a lot of times I, I talk to students and they're like, they're, they get really upset with limitations. And I'm yeah. like, no, you got to find the freedom. The yeah. Limitations are great. Um, was that? I definitely, of? I mean, I, I also impose lots of limitations on myself, but the the film for me was really important because I wanted the film to be I wanted the the actual movie to be timeless. I didn't want it to feel um, the thing with Odsinki, my other film, was that it was shot on the five D, which for those of you that are know it, it's it has a very specific look. 
I mean, it's like the films that were made in the late 90s. You can always tell they were made in the late 90s because they all, you know, have this very particular camera that they were using. And I feel like every film from 2012 and 2013 is going to look the same because everybody was using that same camera. Um, and I really wanted this one to be, that could have been 1960, could have been 1940, could have been 2014. Um, that was, yeah, to me, part of, part of what interested me in general about Eastern Europe is the way that those cultures um, are so integrated into each other. I mean, the language is just one level of it, but the way the borders have moved, um, the way that they layer on top of each other and then sort of shine through each other and stack together in this really incredible way that um, that I, I don't think we have in America in the same way. Um, so I was very fascinated by that, and I think time for me was really important to compress in the same way that I was compressing these these cultures into this this sort of um, stained glass of of history and memory that they experience there I feel like a lot of Eastern European culture is very um, they carry their history with them in a very physical way that we don't in America we're very forward-facing sometimes to our detriment but um, that feeling in Europe was very was very important to me, and I feel like fil film was the only way to represent that. Yeah, it's, 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 it's mega beautiful. I love I love the fact that you used a lot of the chemical stains and stuff in your cutting. Um, and your, your cutting is superlative in all your films. Um, gotta say, big fan. Thanks. Thanks. Um, <laughs> but this is, this is great. Anyway. <laughs> Go on. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, um, so yeah, I think that's a, that was a great. Um, Great decision. So now we're talking about cameras. Um, you point your cameras at a lot of, it seems like, maybe not necessarily you physically doing it, but mm -hmm. your, your cameras do go into a lot of people's spaces, for instance, um, the folks on their balconies. Yeah. And then, I, and I, I love how you have that, got that reverse shot of the, the people looking Watching through the binoculars. Yeah. That's, that's hilarious. Um, that was but, very important to me, that the way that Sorry to oh, interrupt. No, I'm just cool. going to answer the that part of it. Um, the way that Russians especially define themselves so... I mean, we do it too. It's part of human nature, actually, is that we want to be part of an in-group. And, you know, psychologists and science have, scientists have done this test for decades that, you know, no matter how arbitrarily assigned these groups are, people will side with their in-group versus the out-group. But Russians are very clear about it. They have words for it. The way that they are, um, you know, that their immediate family, their outer family, their neighborhood, their village, their countryside, their country, the nation. Um, the, you know, the way that they, they draw these circles around themselves. Um, and, that, and then the way that they look at each other from different perspectives within that circle and the way that they look at us. Um, I don't know. I found that I found it really fascinating, and the way that I mean, also the Russians were so welcoming that that I don't want that to sound like I was um, saying anything bad about them. But the I, I I really appreciated that because I feel like we have that in the United States, but we don't talk about it. In fact, we avoid it at all costs, and I think it's it makes it very hard to have conversations about what's wrong um, in cultures today. But I. It was important to me that that reverse shot was in there because I, I really, it was about them looking at us equally as much as it was yeah, that, yeah, us looking at them. Yeah, sealed the deal. Um, do, do you do you like draw like a line like that you will not cross? And I know you 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 know you you definitely you know you seem like definitely a rebel for sure, <laughs> rebel soul. You, you kind of stated that yourself when we were talking earlier. Yeah, yeah. And then you can see it in your filmmaking, um, but. Is there a line you like? I'm not gonna cross this line when it comes to documenting somebody or something, or because I, 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 I feel like you know you're you're kind of looking into their space, um, yeah. and I, I like how does that make you feel? I mean, I, I think of the guy like on the the guy that that was you know. the hardest that was the hardest element for me was the guy on the elliptical, um, because one thing that I promised myself I would never do in documentary is make somebody look bad without their permission. Um, I really dislike that so many 
quirky, zany documentaries now are about some guy, you know, who thinks he's doing something really cool, and the documentary filmmaker is just making fun of him the whole time. Um, I really think that's despicable. So it was really, I've never wanted to do that. Um, but I don't think I'm making fun of that guy. That I mean, we've all done that. I mean, maybe not on an elliptical outside, but I mean, I dance in my underwear really embarrassingly quite often. So I feel like there's a really human personal element about yeah, that. Yeah, no, I, I completely so agree. I, I, I fought with myself about whether it was worth putting in, but so much of the film is about looking in and looking out that that just felt, it, it was like the one moment of humor in the entire film that felt sort of important. Yeah, yeah, I, I, um, I couldn't agree more. Um, all right, so more questions, we're up to seven. I got, <laughs> I got 10. Okay. Um, all right, so, you know, filmmaking. Um, yep. You know, what, <laughs> filmmaking, <laughs> pop it out, damn. Um, <laughs> Uh, basically, whenever you're doing anything, no matter if it's scripted and locked down and, and tight, you're always going to have these happy accidents. In documentary, more so, um, I feel, because obviously you're kind of searching and um, you know the constant vigilance of you actually being in a place um, for a certain amount of times, things probably will happen if you're lucky. So what, in terms of like happy accidents or fun things, happen to you on like Baba Yaga in particular that you're like, ah. Oh, that's yeah, it. I have a good one, and it, what the saddest part about it is that, well, the saddest part and also the most beautiful part was that we didn't get it on film. Um, we were in Romania on the border with Hungary, and we stumbled on this Hungarian town on the Romanian side. Um, and we were filming, I think the one of the women is in there. She's got a bag of groceries or something, because they all were wearing traditional costume and or outfits, I hate to say costumes, because for them they're not costumes. Um, and the whole town was, and we were like, wow, what a beautiful town. These people are still so you know, in touch with their history. And so we were filming a couple people sort of dilly-dallying about and um, doing their daily routine. And one of them asked our little um, Hungarian lady if we wanted to come back tomorrow for the, the one of the daughters of the town was getting married. We were like, well, yeah, we, we'd love to come back. Thank you so much for inviting us. So we show up, and we, we had to, some other appointment that we had to go to, so we didn't make it for the actual wedding. But after the wedding, there was a long parade that we filmed that didn't end up in the movie um, of them and all their beautiful you know, traditional co outfits and all these you know, people singing and dancing and all these amazing instruments that we'd never seen before. And um, we filmed all that. And they were like, well, you must stay for dinner. You know, we went to talk to the bride in her room with all this incredible embroidery all around her. And she was sitting here at this table. And then all her family was sitting there facing, them, facing her very far away on the floor. And she wasn't, nobody was talking. We came in and everybody was just standing, you know, just very sedate. Hey, Jessica. Wait, I, do we have to open it up? I got I to talk. I have to, um, they're doing a little. A little, dance? little mic check on you. Uh -oh. me, I can, uh -oh. I can tell you a story because <laughs> they told me to keep talking. <laughs> okay, sorry. Well, um, I was I was documenting down in um, Ecuador in, in the Andes Mountains um, for the Center for Disease Control. Mm -hmm. Super fun. It was, it was actually beautiful because you could document people helping people. But we were we were going through all these like little trails like up into you know you'd have to drive out of the nearest city like seven hours to get to this little village. Yeah. And I was going up this, this one trail that was just like 45 degrees, completely slick, just deadly. I heard a snake over here. I was just like, just get me up to the place. So I went up to this like little hut. And I was like, wow, this is beautiful. I'm free. And I walked in, and they had this big screen TV. Oh. Like the, one of the old ones, the big, big ones. And I was just like, how in the world <laughs> does this see? I don't even have a TV. And I looked at, you know. Um, should I just keep telling <laughs> stupid stories? We no. good? All right. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway. Well, so. that was not what happened with this. It so, was so there's silence. Yeah, there's there's silence. We go and we ask if you know if it was all right if we filmed this that we had already filmed the parade, but we w wouldn't produce it without their permission and all that. And they said no, of course, and you must stay for dinner. 
And um, we said, oh, thank you so much. And so the first thing, we get downstairs, and the first thing somebody does is they each hand us, um, I got a, a really old Coke bottle. Sean got a, a mason jar. The Polish kid got, um, I don't even remember what it was. But yeah, just do all these homemade, you know, all these leftover recycled containers with homemade palinka in them, which is the Polish vodka equivalent. And the, the old man who handed it to us through our little Romanian translator, um, or Hungarian translator, told us that they, the, the way it works in the village is that the year that the daughter is born, the father puts the alcohol to ferment. And then on the day of her wedding, he opens all these cases of alcohol. And we never had an empty one after that. It was probably four in the afternoon. And they just keep, the, the more you drink, the more they hand it to you. <laughs> we couldn't, we couldn't, um, yeah, we couldn't get away from it. And everybody's dancing, and it's really beautiful. There are these giant pots where they're cooking. Everybody's very engaged, and there's a band the whole time. And when people aren't cooking, they're drinking and dancing. And, you know, it starts to get dark, and we we're like, yeah, we'll probably eat soon. They set the table. This table is giant. It's a whole, you know, the whole town is coming. And, um, we're like, yeah, it'll be good to eat. We've been drinking all afternoon. And it gets dark, and people start leaving. We're like, what? What's happening? And um, the people leave. We're still just sitting there. We have no idea what's going on. And people start to come back, and they're all dressed even more elaborately, you know, in these, in these amazing outfits. And we're like, OK, now we're going to eat. This is, this is the moment. Um, but we are not eating. We're still drinking, and we're singing, and we're dancing. Everybody's singing and dancing. It's pitch black now, no street lights. You know, and there's this giant tent set up in the street with this table. And we keep going in to check the table. And there's food on the table, but you're not eating. Like, nobody sat down yet. We're not eating. We're like, cool, it's no, it's no problem. 10 o'clock at night. And um, we're like, it's got to be, it's got to be soon. And th people start to gather outside the tent. And we're like, this is it. This is it. We're going we're gonna to eat. Um, and they're all singing together. They all come together and they start singing one song. As before, they were sort of all singing whatever they wanted to sing independently. <laughs> but they're all singing one song. And they start to walk away from the tent. They're like, wait, <laughs> wait, <laughs> what's happening? But <clears throat> we're like, okay, we're just going to follow them. I mean, at this point, we can't shoot. It's pitch black. It's really pitch black. So we're not shooting. We're dr drunk. And <laughs> we're walking down the street. And everybody's singing, everybody, the whole village. And then we've got a band leading us. Um, and we're walking, we're walking, and we walk to the edge of the village, and we keep walking. And we were baffled. But eventually, we hear another group of people coming down the road. And as they get closer, they fall into sync with our band. They also have a band, and they're also singing. And they start to sing the same song. And they come together, and the groom and his village have walked from their village to the bride's village. And they come together, and everybody's hugging and crying wow. and just so ecstatic to be together. And it was so beautiful. And it's all happening in the pitch black. And this, the music is swelling. I mean, everybody's still singing together the same song. And they just like come together as these two waves cra crashing. And then they you know, just embrace. And it was such a poignant idea of what it meant to be married, married in a small village, You know, that it wasn't just you and this man falling in love. It was these two villages that were being united. Um, and so they turn back together and go into the tent, and they sit down to eat. And I was like, we got to go to bed. <laughs> we, didn't, we did not eat a single piece of food, not a tomato, not a piece of lettuce. We just went to bed. It was midnight by the time they got back to the tent. So we never wow. ended up eating. But it was a beautiful, it was a beautiful experience. Cool. Yeah. yeah Sorry, yeah. that was a really long story. No, it was great. Um, I know we're uh, coming up to questions, but I, I ask this of everybody I meet, students, um, fellow f uh, professors, filmmakers, um, basically, how did you decide, like, yeah, film's it, I'm going to do it? How'd that happen? Yeah, um, we talked about this a little bit in the green room. Um, I had grown up without television, 
and I loved science more than anything. I loved biology, um, but I didn't really want to be a scientist. I wanted to be out in the world a little bit more, um, and I thought I wanted to be maybe in science education, but I really don't like kids, so I didn't want to be a teacher. Um, and when I was 14, um, in my high school biology class, our teacher showed me my first nature program. It was David Attenborough's Private Life of Plants. And it was the first time I had ever seen anything like that. And I just felt like my life's path had been illuminated. I was like, this is it. I'm going to make films about nature. Um, and then I worked for a decade um, at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, I worked as a live animal keeper and a docent. And I spent a lot of time working in the butterfly vivarium, which is this very small enclosed space where we have several hundred different species of butterflies. And visitors come in, thousands of visitors a day from all over the world, and they get to be really up close and personal with these really spectacular butterfly butterflies. And um, it was like watching a science experiment because you know there were all these the only variable, variable was the people that were coming in. There were all these constants of the butterfly vivarium. And then you just got to watch people come in. And it was so fascinating to watch children watch their parents and watch parents watch their children and watch people from other cultures watch people from America and Americans watch people from other cultures. And I just, and then everybody watching the butterflies. Um, and I just decided that I was so much more interested in the way that humans look at nature than just the way that nature exists, sort of separate from ourselves. Um, and now they call that ethnobiology. But when I decided that that's what I was going to make films about, that, that term didn't exist yet. And um, yeah, I just I, I decided that was that was what I was going to do. Cool, that's, that's beautiful. And it still fascinates me. I, I just yeah. All right. Um, just for the record, I think they're going to open up um, the floor to questions. So if you guys have a question, which hopefully you do, um, there's a microphone somewhere back in the darkness over there next to that pillar. But um, can I, while, while uh, people are queuing up the, the massive long line, um, <laughs> what would you tell anybody who's thinking about getting into doc, documentary? Um, I would tell them not to call it a documentary and to stop worrying so much about um, distinctions and labels and to, to be true to the art of it and to the truth of it and that facts don't necessarily constitute truth um, and to be respectful and um, to have a second job. <laughs> I always used to think they should teach like waiting and bartending at, at film schools. Yeah. Just to get you through the first few years, you know. <laughs> or the first decade or yeah, two. Yeah. yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, I got all sorts of extra questions here. Um, but is, are the, okay, no, the lights are on back there. The there lights no are on. Oh, we got, yeah. We got the man <laughs> with the plan walking over there, I see. And we got another gentleman stepping up. Should we, should we rock this thing? All right. Cool. Yeah, I saw a familiar name in the credit roll of Eric Roper or Eric Roper. Were you? Er yeah, yeah, Eric Roper. Yeah, uh, I know him as an artist, and mm -hmm. I know that he's, he does a lot of mushroom drawings. I was yeah. wondering if you were familiar with him before the film or after you decided to do the mycology subtext. Well, mycology was always an interest of mine. I actually have a degree in mycology, but the so I knew of his work beforehand, um, and I definitely did not think that I was going to be able to secure his services. But um, we had a friend in common who put us in touch, and he was really interested in the project. And so he half the animation. The people are are Devin Dabrowski, and then a lot of the backgrounds are Eric. Yeah, I kind of recognized his yeah, stylistic. His renderings. Yeah, and he ended up doing the poster, which we never printed because we ran out of money. But yeah, he was great to work with. Really talented individual. Oh, that's cool. I was just yeah. wondering. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. All right. Guys. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, maybe this is a softball, maybe not. But um, so when I've seen some of your work, and certainly in this, um, 
the filmmaker that comes to mind um, in sort of comparison um, is Chris Marker in that sort of hybrid documentary that's really kind of cultural anthropology put into motion. Um, is Chris Marker an influence? And if not, then are there certain filmmakers that are very inspirational to you that, that have sort of been those benchmarks that, that you've tried as a filmmaker yourself to sort of reach? Um, I, I do love Chris Marker. Um, I would not call him a main inspiration for me, but I get that a lot, um, which I'm very flattered by. I have no problem with that. Um, I definitely, I don't know what you mean by benchmarks. I, to me, when I think about a film that I want to make, it's like an itch that I have, and it feels like I have to make it. But if somebody else makes that film, that itch gets scratched. Um, I really wanted to make a film about circus for a really long time, and then I saw this Polish film about a circus called um, People on the Road. I can't pronounce the guy's name, so I'm not even going to try. But um, it's a really beautiful film, and I never felt like I had to make a film about a circus after that. So I don't, I wouldn't say that there are other filmmakers or other films that I think about that I'm like, yeah, I want, I want it to be like that because I definitely feel like if it exists already, I shouldn't be working on it. Um, like if somebody else can master it and do it just right, then there's no need. Um, but I do, I mean, of course, there are lots of filmmakers that I admire and big influences for this project of course, were Eastern European filmmakers, Tarkovsky and Parajanov, and um, I, I mean, I, yeah, um, I'm trying to think of other. You, you got any Chick Strand in there? No. Chick Strand, experimental documentary. Oh, yeah. Filmmaker. I saw I saw like a, like her, her film Fake Fruit Factory. I, I was, I was seeing like these little glimmering shimmers huh. throughout throughout your film and then you showed like this this the, piece of eaten yeah. watermelon and I was like it's gotta be <laughs> I don't know I don't know her work. I don't know her work. But um, definitely Chantal Ackerman, um, her movie from the East, I had seen years and years before we made this. And then when we got back from Eastern Europe I watched it again and I was like, oh my gosh, we just totally ripped this off without even remembering that that's what we were doing. There are so many moments in this film that feel like little pieces from that film, so. Uh, yeah. If I can ask one more question too. Uh, so you've obviously been very fascinated and you've even sort of said up here, you know, the ways in which you've been influenced to look and explore uh, at other cultures. Is there anything in America that you could foresee wanting to explore? You know, you sort of have said, not, I would say, disparaging things about America, but, but it seems that maybe, is there anything here that, that you would want to explore? Yes, definitely. Um, I actually, the fir part of the reason I never made anything in, in America was because I love that. Um, I love being an outsider. I love being able to come in from the outside and see it without sort of the baggage that I have with my own history. Um, but after this film I made, a, I drove across the United States making a series of short films about men at work. And um, it was a really incredible experience. But one of the things that I became so fascinated by was um, cowboy and rodeo culture, which to me, I will always be an outsider in that <laughs> field <laughs> because, yeah, for many obvious reasons. Um, one of which is the fact that they want to get on things that are going to hurt them. <laughs> um, and yeah, I would love to make a film about rodeo. I would love to. Someday, maybe. All right. More questions. Hello. Hi. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. <laughs> um, well, yeah. Um, so, well, seeing Sean Price Williams' name answered a lot of my questions. Um, it's sort of about that. You, I've, I've noticed that you have this, um, you have this tendency to like focus on little moments, details, processes, whether it's foraging for mushrooms or cutting down the tree or herding and slaughtering reindeer. 
Um, but then there's, they accumulate and they, they sort of leave you with this like much larger emotion and an idea that are like almost operatic. When you're shooting, what's going on in your head? Are you like thinking about all these things? Or are you just in the moment focused? Um, <clears throat> well, that's one of the things. I mean, it depends. Because I shot Atsinki by myself, right. so that was a very different experience. Um, and that movie is a very direct translation of how I saw the film when I started, because there was no intermediate. I wasn't working with anyone being like, oh, don't forget this and this and this. Um, so that, for me, was, there was almost no thinking involved, because I knew exactly what I wanted. And as soon as I got it, I turned the camera off. Like I, It was very easy for me to know, like, OK, that moment's captured. That's done. Um, working with Sean is really different. We would go into a place and I would talk about what interested me um, about what we were watching. Normally we would argue <laughs> about what interested him, and which was normally women. And um, then we would um, come to a certain, certain level of agreement. Um, and for me, I often had ideas ahead of time. And, but what I love about working with Sean is that he does his best work when he's excited about what he's shooting. Um, and he is really good at, at sort of interpreting what I'm interested in and going his own way with it. Um, so it's hard, it's hard to answer because there was definitely, I mean, we were very much in tune. And I, you know, I'd tap his shoulder and be like, this way, and this way, and this. And, and he always knew what I was talking about. But, um, but it, was, I, it was more organic, I think, than, than me being like, well, what, I'm, you know, I want this process because what I'm going to be talking about is this bigger picture. It was, I'm obsessed with processes and sort of the rituals of culture that happen that we don't even realize that we do necessarily or why we do them. Um, yeah, I, I love to watch people brush their teeth and wash their face because everybody does it so particularly. But it's, um, that's a weird thing to just watch people do. Um, <laughs> so I don't generally. Um, but the, I would totally have a film of just people brushing their teeth. Um, I'd watch it. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, but that, I mean, I think that that culture is really buried in, in the things that we don't even see. So how know. is the process working with him? Are you talking like only specifics, what to point at? Or are you telling him you want to feel a certain way about this thing that you're looking at? Um. Because all of his stuff that I've seen, it all, I, I mean, it, it's like a whole. It, yeah, it all, I mean, it's, he very much has a particular aesthetic that he is capable of. Um, I think, I don't know, it's hard. We shot this back in 2000, 2009 and 2010, so it's been a long time. Um, and we were in a very different place there. Um, it's hard for me to put myself back in that. Well, I have another question if that yeah. helps. Okay. Uh, are you, do you like edit in your head as you're shooting, or are you just not worry about that? Um, I did with Odds and Key. But um, with this one, sometimes I had, there were certain things that I knew in advance were going to happen, like the old woman's skin and the butchering of the pig. That yeah. was very specific. We w went all over Ukraine looking for pig butchers because I was I knew exactly what I wanted and we just couldn't find it. Um, but I'll, I think some of that happens more in the edit, um, and it, I think a lot of that has to do with Sean sort of and his magic. Um, yeah, it was. Hmm. I, it's hard for me to say. Sean and I were also, we were a couple for nine years, which we broke up right before this film premiered. Um, it's good, we're all good. Sure. But it was, um, so it's hard for me to put myself back in that and remember sure. what exactly, how we were communicating. And was there, there was probably like a shorthand. It was just, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was a lot, there was a lot of touch. There was a lot of like, mm. go this way, go this way, like hooking pockets that I probably wouldn't do with other cinematographers. Uh, should I still? More questions. Um, how do you feel about the difference between shooting on film and shooting digitally? I mean, I have lots of mixed feelings about it. I would rather shoot on film any day of the week. Um, but there's a convenience to having um, you know, a camera that can fit in your back pocket. And 
I wouldn't have been able to make Otsinki if I wasn't willing to shoot digitally. Um, and Beto Queen, I think, really belongs in a digital world. I think it just depends on the project, honestly. Cool. I don't, I, yeah, I don't want to say bad things about either of them. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you again. Thank you. All right. Cool. Um, great questions. Um, all right. <laughs> that's the last question, the big one. Yeah. Um, all right. So it's kind of, kind of. Uh, uh, I, 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 I used to do this do document a lot of people, and no matter who they were, I would ask them this question because it always. Do uh, you believe in me. monogamy? <laughs> that was always the question I was asking. Uh, <laughs> no. Okay. Not, not quite, all right. Not quite that one. All right. Um, um, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. The question. All right. So, this is if you could have your dream meal. Oh. Your dream meal. Who would you be eating with? Okay. Anybody living or dead? Okay. Where would you be eating? And what would you be eating? Oh, God, this might take a minute. Yeah. So, no rush. What would we be eating? I'd say Japanese food, natto, some natto. Um, yeah, that's easy. Ice cream. There would have to be ice cream also. Um, I mean, do I get to have more than one person or is it yeah, just one yeah, person? Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. So David Abra would be there, of course. Um, maybe Claire Denis, um, John Lloyd. Wow. John Lloyd is a, a comedian and sort of, I don't even know what he is. He's just an amazing guy. He's British. He makes that show QI with Stephen Fry. He makes a really amazing podcast called Museum of Curiosity. He's hilarious and wonderful. Uh, John Lloyd, yeah, he would be there. Let's see. Um, you don't have to think too hard. I mean, yeah, this is, I, I don't know, I don't know that I could narrow it down. Um, maybe Donald Trump. No, no. <laughs> Gary Cooper? I would take Gary Cooper. Wow. Yeah, um, yeah, I like it. <laughs> speaking of cowboys, yeah, like maybe Gary Cooper and Bud Bedeker or something. I love, I love old westerns a lot. Um, yeah, I don't know. Those are all men. No, Claire Denis, she's a woman, thank goodness. Um, so gotta, so gotta get where, where would it be? Ladies. So you got where? cowboys, you got Japanese food? Yeah, cowboys, Japanese food, some filmmakers. Um, vodka and chainsaws. <laughs> vodka and chainsaws. Where could it, it can be anywhere? Yeah, it can be anywhere. It can be on the moon. Well, no, no thanks. <laughs> I would get motion sick going there. <laughs> um, God, I you know. Maybe. Chicago on the stage. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> this place um, is so awesome. No, I'm here. taking this question very seriously. Um, <laughs> Maybe the art, maybe in the sauna. Like maybe afterwards sauna. we go to sauna and we're up in the Arctic and then we dip in a frozen lake or something. I feel like that's a, that's a good way to have have a meal, cool. either the before or after. Melt. Unless you take it in the sauna, of course, and, <laughs> yeah. Then, it yeah. and then it melts. Yeah, but that, I guess that, that yeah, let's All we're right. setting it in the Arctic and we're gonna take sauna after. Cool. All right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> here comes our. Fabulous oh. host, Wendy. Hey, guys. What's up? That was fantastic. Let's hear for these guys. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank for you. being here. Thank you guys for coming out. Yes, absolutely.